organization is called Women's Energy Matters. I'm also on the Sierra Club Energy Committee statewide in California and have been for many years. So um, this is the um, alternative bundle procurement plan that we put in last year after Fukushima. This is May, tw May 4th initially. Um, and our plan was an alternative to the utilities. And we said, given that Fukushima has just happened and it's very clear now, as it really should have always been, that nuclear power is not a viable resource. And we are in the procurement proceeding. And therefore, they are supposed to be able to decide what is best for California to use for power. Um, and so that's within the state's jurisdiction. And I'm trying to get the California Public Utilities Commission to act according to their um, jurisdiction on this issue. Now, we had a problem in this proceeding because the president of the CPUC, who was the commissioner in charge of the procurement proceeding, was a vice president of Edison for many years. And he actually is the guy who ran the no campaign on the nuclear moratorium back in the 70s. So he was pro on the pro-nuclear side. California has a moratorium, if you don't know about it, that's to prevent any um, new nuclear power plants from being built until there's a solution for the waste. So that's um, in existence in California. Um, so that's Michael Peavy, and he is the commissioner in charge of this program. So I put it out there anyway. <laughs> this is, and, and there it is. That's my plan. The utilities said, um, we want to strike that testimony. They just want to get rid of it. And the judge, to his credit, said, uh, no, I think we can have this on a kind of a high level. We'll talk about the policy, general policy issues of nuclear power and replacement resources. We don't want to really get in any numbers. Um, and so later on, he struck when PG&E claimed it would cost $16 billion to replace nuclear power in California. He actually struck that testimony because he said, we're not going to get any, into any specific numbers. Um, but anyway, the, the so utilities good. didn't like this, but after the judge ruled that we were going to talk about it, then they filed um, responsive testimony, and I'll get to what they said in their response in a minute. But we should remember, first of all, that Sacramento Municipal Utility District um, the, uh, closed down a nuclear power plant, Rancho Seco, um, when the voters in the district voted to close it down. This is the only place in the United States where um, people have been able to vote on closing a nuclear power plant. Um, and w in the years after they closed it down, they used energy efficiency, demand response, and local solar to replace that nuclear power. What so year was? Uh, it was in 1989 when people voted to shut it down. Uh, the fellow who spoke this morning, uh, David uh, Freeman, became the general manager of SMUD at the time that the nuclear power plant was replaced. And so he's done energy efficiency since the 50s. He wrote the first book on energy efficiency. And he sponsored a program, actually a woman in SMUD ran this program apparently, um, but it was extremely successful. And one of the things that they did was plant trees in Sacramento, which lowered the temperature of the city seven degrees. Ah. So that in itself saved a tremendous, a tremendous amount of energy. Um, and so they considered that an energy efficiency program. I have not been able to get the utilities to consider anything like that. But anyhow, this effort um, to replace Francho Seco propelled SMUD to number one in the United States. The cleanest utility in the United States was Sacramento Municipal Utility District for many, many years. And they never raised the rates. They're 25% cheaper than PG&E. And I would like to just let you know that nationwide, public municipal power companies, publicly owned power companies, have been 20% cheaper than investor-owned utilities for 100 years. Now, investor-owned utilities, I abbreviate as IOUs. <laughs> <laughs> That's actually what they call themselves, too. So, um, you owe me. so anyway, you know, here we are. We're in the procurement proceeding. And my question was, can California investor-owned utilities allow demand resources to compete against nuclear power? 
because my proposal was this. Here we have these two big nuclear power plants in California, and we have Diablo Canyon, which got a lot of attention, San Onofre, which got very little attention over the years. Um, but San Onofre is um, within 50 miles of 8 million people. So uh, maybe it ought to get a little attention. And anyway, the um, information that I had that I have been presenting to the California Public Utilities Commission for six years now, uh, no, five years, is that New England independent system operator, this, this is the grid operator in New England, has allowed demand resources to compete against supply side resources. So they allow energy efficiency, that's EE, DR is demand response, that's when you're paid to curtail your power during a shortage. And solar distributed generation, they can compete as capacity resources in an auction. And the first auction, energy efficiency won the auction. Um, and the ISO wrote a manual for how to measure it, how to measure demand side resources to make it viable to replace um, supply side resources. Well, the utilities in this proceeding, when I tried to present this information in the hearings at the procurement case, the utilities said, that can't possibly be true. <laughs> And it w really was a problem in the utilities, and this is where the judge was no help. Um, I am happy to say that of all agencies, the FERC, Federal Energy Regulatory Commission, has just come out with guidelines which are based on the New England guidelines. So this past week, we started creating a, a, a lot of discomfort in California over the fact that FERC is ahead of the great California cleanest, you know, I mean, they're very big on their, you know, energy efficiency reputation, their great um, clean reputation. So anyhow, now in New England, six states are allowing energy efficiency to compete, and California does not. Hmm. Yeah. Can we hold the questions oh, till sure. the end? Yeah, Would that be a problem? Sure, okay, so how do you make it possible for energy efficiency to compete? You've got to know First of all, most importantly, where is the energy efficiency happening? Right now, they give you an energy efficiency number and it is somewhere in PG&E's territory. They won't tell you where. It's somewhere in Edison's territory. So if you're in a power plant case or a transmission case and you're trying to get them to use energy efficiency instead of a power plant, they build these things for like five minutes a year for the you know, peak energy. The, that's the kind of shortage that you have that re, you know, results in hundreds of millions of dollars being spent on a generator or a, power, or a transmission line. And so without that information, energy efficiency, demand resources cannot compete. And that is a problem nationwide. It has been for many, many years. Because California's energy efficiency system was exported around the country and we don't measure where we don't tell anybody where it is. So this is one of the big fights that I've been having is how to get the utilities to report to somebody, to the commission. And so they not only don't report, but here is PG&E's testimony in their rate case, which I, God help me, was in. Um, the load forecasting methodology does not adjust for changes in peak load because of your solar rooftops or energy efficiency. In other words, PG <coughs> cannot know exactly where increases, reductions or increases will occur. Okay, so that is, that's what pg &E says. They cannot know. It's like, hey, they know where your solar power panel is. They had to hook it up. They know where energy efficiency is. They did the energy efficiency or they sponsored those programs because they're in charge of all of it. The independent system operator in California testified in the procurement proceeding in response to our data request that the resources attached to the utility distribution systems are invisible to the ISO. So you have to understand a little bit about deregulation to understand what this means. In deregulation, um, the grid operator becomes the manager of transmission. Now that's the big wires on those high towers, that's the transmission system. 
Um, the smaller wires that go through the neighborhood are called distribution wires. And they are completely under the control of the utilities in California and in other deregulated states. So therefore, the grid operator doesn't know what's happening on the distribution system. But that's where your rooftop solar is. That's where energy <coughs> efficiency would show up. And, you know, so this is, this is a crazy system. You know, they, they just don't have that information. And they acknowledge to me that this could result in forecast errors. In other words, you're going to spend hundreds of millions for power plant that you don't need. Um, so my proposal was that the California Public Utilities Commission should order the utilities to reveal the location and reveal it by substation because you don't want to run into the problem of the um, con customer confidentiality. You cannot ask the utilities to reveal what is happening at your house. You wouldn't really want that, right? And so. But you could aggregate that by neighborhood and by substation, and this is the way the independent system operators operate. They know what's going on on the substation. And that is, if you're in a procurement proceeding, you'll see a list. Here is the load on the substation. You have to be able to meet that load. That's the whole game of procurement. So it's how do we get energy efficiency to be able to play in that arena? And that's what I've been working on for about six years. And we're almost there because the new commissioner in this new procurement proceeding, which started a couple of weeks ago, is a guy that I used to know from, um, he was a colleague who was also in procurement proceedings. He was one of the other interveners. Now he's a commissioner. And it's a new ball game. So we're going to have a lot of fun. And uh, the projected need for the local capacity, this is the ISOs figures. This is what the California Independent System Operators said that we need um, in the absence of San Onofre. For the hottest days this summer, we would need about 240 megawatts for, um, for LA and 340 megawatts for San Diego. Now you'll notice that that's nowhere near the size of the San Onofre reactor, which is 2200, 2, right? So hey, it looks like 2200 is a little more than we need. So this is it. We we have to meet this number. Here's what the ISO proposed: <laughs> restart Huntington Beach units two, three, and four. Now this is a dirty old power plant. It was so dirty that they shut it down and blew a hole through the, the boiler to make sure that they would never run again. So now they're talking about fixing that and putting it back online. And they want to do- Is it coal or what is it? No, natural it's natural gas. gas. Okay. Okay, here is a chart that I presented in the procurement proceeding in the beginning with my testimony last May, a year ago in May. Here is the excess of power um, in California, with or without uh, nuclear. So the little chart on the top, the pink line is the nuclear power in California. The excess power is that green chunk. I mean, we have a vast oversupply of, of resources. The, um, the demand here, this is the excess power. You'll see right in 2011, it's 150%. That's how much we have. Over here in 2020, if everything happens the way the CPUC assumes it will, we'll have 156% of what we need. So these assumptions, this, this chart is actually puts together in a graphic form the numbers that the California Public Utilities Commission provided as the assumptions that utilities were required to use in the procurement proceedings. So we didn't do anything other than just aggregate them and put them in a graphic form. But this is having an impact in California because some of the people in the San Onofre area have been, <laughs> been presenting it to it's city great. councils and, and it's, uh, it's really been fun. Um, so in our work right now, in the current proceeding, we, uh, we remind us, if you see also ISO, I've testified be before the ISO, that as of January 31st this year when San Onofre was shut down, Edison still had 
$600 million of energy efficiency money that was approved for the current cycle, which is 2010 to 2012. So we are in the third year of a cycle, and their total amount that they were given was 1.2 million approximately. So they still had half of it left. They haven't really been working real hard on their energy efficiency. So they had a lot left, and there is no requirement. CPUC allows them to move that money around to different programs pretty much as they desire. They have to report it sometimes, but not even that often. Which is one reason why energy efficiency is such a slush fund, because they can move the money anywhere. They don't have to report where they did the energy efficiency. Mm -hmm. Now, is that a recipe for corruption or mm -hmm. what? Um, but also, three years ago, uh, the commission gave Edison the authority to build 500 megawatts of solar distributed generation. They didn't do it. They, t they said, well, let somebody else build 250 megawatts. We'll just keep 250. They didn't do that either. So that's, they're sitting there with author, authorization to build 500 megawatts of solar DG. This, this alone could replace San Onofre a couple of times over, mm. these um, programs. And now Edison in the proceeding, in the response to WIM, said that, oh, we'll have blackouts without San Onofre. So they were going to open this power plant. Um, they're willing to allow a little bit of demand response, but nothing serious, and they're fighting against consideration of energy efficiency. So this is what's happening as of last week, but this is the fight that's going on right now. And now this is what PG&E and Edison responded to WEM last year in the uh, previous proceedings. So Edison says it's going to take seven to ten years to replace nuclear power plants. And, you know, and they, they called us irresponsible for saying that it could happen. And we said, well, hey, you know, you ought to get started yeah. because you might need this. Because our whole point was that nukes can trip offline at any moment. Or, you know, they ought to be shut down yesterday, yesterday last week. But anyway, it, there's no telling what will happen between now and, and the next 10 years. So mm -hmm. then PG&E claimed that there would be... Uh, 16 billion, and that is a figure that they have filed in their licensing application, relicensing. So they claim they considered alternative resources. These, these are hundreds of pages of documents. I was not in this proceeding, but I finally decided I need to read these documents. I need to understand how they dismissed the alternatives and what it was that they did. So they named four potential alternatives. They excluded these things, which are very effective at reducing peak load, demand response, combined heat and power, the storage technologies, and solar. Um, and and PG&E's documents failed to immediately reveal that they rejected all but one alternative. Here are the alternatives that they considered, gas fire combined cycle plants. They said they considered energy efficiency, but they, ha ha, they know that they can't be used. Renewables, coal, even though coal is outlawed in California right now. But, but here is the game, and this is why I want everybody to understand how NRC has rigged the game of alternatives. Each resource has to be new. Each resource, in other words, you have to consider energy efficiency. Can energy efficiency replace the entire output of the nuclear plant? 2,200 megawatts of energy efficiency. Well, I would say yes, but most people would say, oh, and that's not possible. At some point, you're going to need some kind of power. And so here is the Nuclear Regulatory Commission's um, regulations. The report's not in required to include a discussion of need. So the fact that we don't need this power in California, won't need it for the next 10 years, so we could build up slowly and it would be much, you know, much cheaper. You know, when you're using energy efficiency to offset the cost of renewables, so you, got, you can save the energy and give yourself time to build renewables, plus the energy efficiency is half the price of coal. I mean, it's real cheap. It's very affordable. So it offsets the more expensive renewable energy. Um, but the way NRC um, uh, has it rigged is that you don't 
consider a mix of resources. This is actually illegal in California. I'll explain that in a minute, but, but I love this quote. Um, well, you, there's a whole lot of things you could do, but we're not going to consider any of those things um, because it should be limited to an analysis of single discrete electric generation resources. Mm. Now, who, what resources can compete? <coughs> Only really, I mean, geothermal maybe, but that's hard to, you know, you would need transmission. The only thing that could actually kind of fit this um, recipe is a, a gas plant or a coal plant. Mm -hmm. And so then you're forced to propose n not one, but many gas plants. I mean, it would take five or six to replace San Onofre. That costs a bundle of money, and then you got to buy the gas, which is cheap now, but it might be more later. Um, or you would use coal. So then you have all this money, plus you have greenhouse gas emissions that would be emitted by all these things. So then the, the nuclear industry says, see, nuclear is the cheap, you know, green <laughs> alternative. <laughs> That's how they do it. It's, this is the game right here. And it's in the regs. Um, but as I said, it's illegal based on California law because we're required to use a diverse mix of resources. And so that is one of the um, citations that we're using, and that's one of the basis of our, of our um, litigation. And obviously there are many other, um, you know, benefits, which is that they, they can build energy efficiency. I mean, you can do energy efficiency next week. You can do solar, <laughs> you know, in a couple of weeks. It's all, it all can happen very, very rapidly. It's got by far the best um, job creation. Um, you're minimizing, if not retiring, old dirty power plants. Um, and you are far um, less uh, greenhouse gas emissions than nuclear power. You know, I mean, there is, there's absolutely no comparison, and there's no, none of the risk, none of these dangers of the nukes, all these other things we've been talking about all day. And, as I said, this is making good use of the programs that have already been funded. Unfortunately, the utilities are in control of energy efficiency. This is a, a strategy that California utilities put together, and this is based on some real skullduggery that happened in the 1970s, in the very early um, stages, the first Jerry Brown administration, there was a, um, you know, a, a terrible, um, thing that actually Chevron went to a new agency that was supposed to do energy efficiency and renewables and said you want to survive we can go over to the legislature and kill your funding tomorrow and uh, and Chevron gave them a list of 10 people they should fire the number one person on that list was the guy who was in charge of integrated resources planning which is how you use a demand system along with the supply system to keep the lights on. Number two guy they wanted to fire was the person in who, who was in charge of energy efficiency and his vision was we'll teach energy efficiency in the schools and he was fired and that's because the utilities and the oil companies are teaching the children mm -hmm. in the schools. We need to understand the extent of penetration of the industry into our school system. It's really a scandal. But I gotta stop for now. I mean, you're all like ready to hear more. I'd love to tell you more, but that's um, that's basically the short version of what's going on. Mm -hmm.